tonight. We're going to try something new. You may have seen we have index cards and pens at the end of each aisle. If you have questions you want to write down, we've got two members of the America staff in the back, uh, Ashley McKinless and Olga Segura, who will be just roaming the room. So if you've got a question, just raise your hand and they'll grab them for you. So we're going to try to leave 15 or 20 minutes at the end for questions. Um, I think we can get started. So uh, I, I'm very pleased to uh, bring Paula James Martin, Professor Elizabeth Johnson here tonight. This is a, co a continuation of a conversation that they started at Fordham University in the spring uh, when Father Martin's book, Jesus, A Pilgrimage, uh, was released. I want to note also that uh, Sister Johnson, of course, is the author of many books, including Consider Jesus, uh, which is particularly pertinent tonight, but also Ask the Beasts, uh, Darwin and the God of Love. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit at the end about that too. Those books are available for sale in the back and um, I hope you will all, they'll be signing books at the end, at the end so please stop by on your way out. Um, so why don't we get started and uh, the, the way, just a note on procedure tonight, I'm going to try to uh, let the, you, you folks take over the conversation but I'm going to pose a question to one of you and then uh, give the other a chance to respond at some point. Uh, so you can talk about that topic, and then I'll alternate. So I'll go first to Father Martin and then to Professor Johnson. So we're going to start with uh, Father Martin. Uh, Jesus at the Pilgrimage is your 10th book. Uh, why did you choose to write about Jesus at this point in your writing career? And then I, I would suggest a follow-up question for Sister Johnson being, uh, this was your, uh, Consider Jesus was your first book. Why did you start there? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tim. I just want to say thank you to the American Bible Society for uh, inviting me. Uh, thank you for all of you for coming out. I also want to say uh, thanks to, we we'll call each other Beth and Jim tonight. Um, I want to thank Beth Johnson uh, for many things. Uh, she has been, for me, uh, one of the guiding lights in my own understanding of Jesus, particularly her book, uh, Consider Jesus, which has been a huge help for me in my life, in my prayer, and in my writing, uh, and also she who is was very influential, truly our sister, and I just want to say what a gift she is to the church and how happy I am to be on the same stage with her. So thank you. So uh, I, I wrote this book called Jesus and Pilgrimage, which is on sale, or can, you can get it on Amazon.com if it's all sold out. And uh, to the question of why at this time, um, I'm a member of the Society of Jesus, I'm a Jesuit, and I, Jesus is the most important person in my life, and I thought that I always wanted to write something about Jesus, but um, I was waiting for the right time. I let the kind of Holy Spirit guide me in terms of what I'm interested in writing, and I felt at one point I really am ready to write something about Jesus, and I wanted to speak mostly about Jesus in spiritual terms, but I also realized I was very interested in the historical Jesus. I really love reading books about the historical Jesus. I love John Meyer and John Dominic Crossan, and uh, Beth does a lot of work in, um, for example, in Truly Our Sister, she has this great chapter on Galilee that I highly recommend to you. So um, those were two parts I wanted to talk about, the Christ of faith, uh, the Jesus of history, and then uh, my editor, uh, who preceded Matt, Drew Christensen, said, if you're going to write a book on Jesus, you have to go to the Holy Land. And that was the third part of this book, and that kind of really helped it to take shape. And uh, I was—I really enjoyed spending time on it. So it, it was basically for me, it felt like the Kairos to, to start talking about Jesus. Well, I did my doctoral dissertation on Christology, especially the Resurrection, and then began to teach courses at Catholic University um, in uh, the, the theology of Jesus Christ at the graduate level mostly to seminarians. And one day, it struck me, this is too good to keep in the classroom or to seminarians. And so I began to take the lectures that I was giving uh, and turn them into this book chapter by chapter in a way that was accessible to, to a wider audience, to, to people in the pews, so we say. And so that's how that book came about. It was really direct from my own teaching uh, to that. I'll just say one other point. The Catholic uh, Bishops Conference of South Africa invited me to come uh, the summer of 1987 and give a series of lectures in South Africa to update the bishops and the priests on Christology. 
And so I used the lectures out of my own uh, course for that. And again, one of them kept saying to me, you've got to publish these. So they had um, recorded them and then had somebody transcribe them. And they put it together in one of these sort of Xerox type uh, arrangements, you know, between covers, hard covers. And so I was getting enough signals, you know. So that, that really was the book to begin with. And so I went from the classroom to South Africa to consider Jesus so that people at large could see what is liberation theology saying? What are the biblical scholars saying? What are women saying, feminist theology, about Jesus? Because all this theology was bubbling up. And it just seemed to be very precious and, and good to share. Well, I thought um, perhaps Dr. Johnson, you could speak about, um, there's so many books about Jesus, but as uh, Father Martin writes in his book, uh, they often fall into two categories, which is writing about the Jesus of history and then the Christ of faith. Um, your book tries to bridge that and bring those two together. Well, why is that, would you say, there is that distinction in uh, studies of Jesus' life? Perhaps it would be good just to clarify those terms. The Jesus of history refers to the human being, Jesus of Nazareth, and what he was like in his own skin uh, in the days of his own life. And the Christ of faith refers to the one risen from the dead by the power of the Spirit, in whom people put their faith, who will then help us also triumph over death. So the, the Jesus walking around Galilee at the, uh, in the days of his own life was not considered the Son of God. You know, people asked him, why are you the Christ? You know, and he'd say, well, what do you think? And <laughs> so on. Um, but, but he became the Christ of faith in the light of the resurrection. So if you're talking about the historical person and what he actually did, you could see it and hear it if you were there. You're talking about the Jesus of history. And if you're talking about the Christ of faith, you're talking about the Christ presented in the Gospels, in the Eucharist, where two or three are gathered, and those who are hungry whom you feed, the Christ of faith. Now, when this distinction first came in, it was in 18th century Germany when they began to use historical methods uh, beginning to work out in history, secular history, and apply it to the Gospels. And what I have discovered in studying this, that it sort of went in a, in a dialectic back and forth. Some people who wanted to throw off the authority of the church used historical methods of the Gospels to debunk Jesus as the Christ of faith. He didn't really say this, he didn't really do that, da, 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 da. so it became a tool to attack faith, if you will. And in reaction, in 19th century Germany, very strongly, there was another wave of scholarship which basically said, take your historical critical methods and go jump in the lake. You know, that we are the pious ones, we need a storm-free region where none of these debates go on about historical Jesus, but just we can read the gospel and believe in Christ on our own. And it struck me, coming into the 20th century, Roman Catholics were very protected from this debate because Roman Catholics themselves were not supposed to read the Bible. So that's, and it wasn't a big deal. You, know, you, you had a read and explained it, uh, mass, and you know, very few other people were, were Catholics were doing this work. But the Second Vatican Council Open the door. Now, there had been a biblical renewal before, but in Dei Verba, which is this 50th anniversary we're celebrating, uh, the, the decree on Revelation put the Bible up front for Catholic life, for Catholic piety, for Catholic um, scholarship, and basically called for new translations, since we have all these kinds of Bibles and so on and so forth. And in the middle of that um, decree on Revelation, the Second Vatican Council said this, talking about the Gospels. Indeed, after the ascension of the Lord, the apostles handed onto their hearers what he had said and done. This they did with that clearer understanding which they enjoyed after they had been instructed by the events of Christ's risen life and after they had been taught by the light of the spirit of truth. In other words, already 
what we're getting in the Gospels is recollected in the light of faith. And then the, the decree continues. The Savior Office wrote the four Gospels, selecting some things from the many which had been handed on by word of mouth, reducing some of them to a synthesis, explaining other things in view of the situation of their own churches, and preserving sometimes the form of proclamation, but always in such fashion that they told us the honest truth about Jesus. But <laughs> well, that last line makes me laugh, because how did the honest truth that you've synthesized and selected and interpreted? <laughs> but, but see, this is a very sophisticated presentation, but what's interesting about it, it is a conciliar authorization of the historical method. You know? No other church has this. So we went from, you're not allowed even to read that, to you must use this historical method. What I think um, has happened that in the Catholic tradition, and I speak out of the, uh, the sense we have that you don't go only with reason on the one hand, you don't go only with faith on the other hand, but faith and reason working together can release a larger understanding. So it strikes me that um, in Catholic scholarship, and you know, Meyer, John Meyer, and so on, are good examples of this. They're using the historical method rigorously on the Gospels according to the mandate here of the Second Vatican Council, but not using it to destroy the faith. Just to conclude my remarks here, what they are using it for, as I've watched this happen over the decades that I've taught this, the historical method is being used to change our imaginations about Jesus. I think that's its most significant impact. You know? It's bringing back how Jewish he was, how this whole context helps interpret what went on in the Gospels. Um, it's giving us an understanding of him as utterly human, um, as well as being the Son of God. So it's being used not to destroy the faith, but to build up a different imagination of the faith. Um, but it certainly can work the other way, and that's your question, Tim, is, is how it has been used, let's say, by the enemies of uh, faith. Yeah, I would. Just, I mean, I would just add to that that uh, you can still see that distinction today uh, in different books. So oftentimes, if you read books on the historical Jesus, right, which are, you know, as Beth was saying, which is incredibly helpful for our understanding of who Jesus was. What was life like in Nazareth, right? You know, Nazareth. There is about 200 people here today. This is as big as Nazareth was. You know, Nazareth was yeah, 200 or 400 people. And you can see people when you say that they say, oh, I didn't know that. So that when, for example, Jesus stands up in the synagogue and you know says the Spirit of the Lord is upon him, you realize that you know people would have known him easily in a small town. That kind of you know small detail from archaeological research and historical Jesus studies is very helpful, as Beth was saying, for us to understand who he was. The problem is that in a lot of the historical Jesus books, good as they are, you know, I mean some of the best books, they will say, well, you know, topics like the resurrection and the miracles we can't talk about. That belongs to faith. And so you're kind of left with only one side of, of him. But just as often, uh, books, and I've read a lot of them, books that um, are you know, spirituality books, for example, um, or books on the Christ of faith or on the Eucharist or something like that, they will say consciously, uh, we have to leave aside, for example, we have to leave it for aside for now, mere historical matters. And I can't tell you how many times I've read that, as if that's not important. So it really doesn't matter, you know, where Jesus was from. What matters is that we believe in him as, you know, the risen one. So to have that distinction today in, in books especially, and in, you know, and, and in popular books, I think is unfortunate because we get, we get, you know, either God pretending to be human or a human pretending to be God. And to bring those two things together, one of the most helpful insights I had was from one of my professors, uh, his father Stanley Marrow, uh, who was a Jesuit, may he rest in peace, who taught the Gospel of John. And he was talking about, this really sort of blew my mind, he was talking about Jesus after the resurrection. And he says, uh, the risen Christ is, I love this word, identifiable with Jesus of Nazareth. For him to have been raised as anything other than the Jesus of Nazareth that they knew would void the resurrection of all meaning. In other words, you know, if it's some new creation in a sense. So there's that sense of that kind of, kind of linking of the resurrection, which is so beautiful, but... You know, as Beth was saying, I guess it's that history that has kind of kept the two fields apart, uh, sadly, I think. 
Well, that's a question for Father Martin. Um, the other piece of your book, in addition to going through the, the Jesus of history, the Christ of faith, is your journey, is your pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Uh, you know, surprise, it was your first time there. Uh, how did that experience shape your understanding of Jesus? Of course, the Holy Land notice the fifth gospel. Well, as I, as I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, our editor-in-chief had said, you need to go, and I resisted. And I've heard this from a number of my friends. Um, I said, I don't want to go and have my image of the Holy Land, you know, from my mental image and prayer, ruined by these kind of touristy sites. I really, I imagined it like, you know, casinos and things like that. <laughs> but you never know. Um, and I said to him, you know, I have my own Holy Land. I, I know what Nazareth looks like in my mind, and I don't want that ruined. And he, he really forced me uh, in a good way. And Drew had been to the Holy Land multiple times. And it uh, changed my understanding of Jesus in a way that's hard to describe. A friend of mine said, it's like uh, no matter how well you know a friend, you'll know him better when you go to his house or his hometown or meet his parents, right, or see his family. You get this kind of deeper sense. And to be able to stand on the, sea, the shore of the Sea of Galilee and look out and say, you know, one of the great things is you go there and the town of Capernaum, for example, which was his base of ministry, you know, in Galilee, right, there are the first century ruins of Capernaum. I mean, they're there. They're right there. There's the Sea of Galilee, right? It's largely unchanged around its shorelines. And so you can stand at the place where Jesus clearly must have stood and say, this is what he saw. You know, it was electric for me. At one point, we were staying uh, in a Franciscan monastery over the, on the Mount of the Beatitudes, which is right over the Sea of Galilee. And I said to the sister in charge, you know, what is that over there? I, don't, I didn't know the topography. And she said, oh, that's the other side. <laughs> they went to the, there it is. They went to the other side. So it really... It was, it was so beautiful. It really grounded that in a way that I couldn't understand. And then simple things. You know, in the Gospels, you know, they say, and then they went to Jericho. And you think, well, that's nice. And it's like going from the Upper West Side to the, you know, to, to the Lower East Side or something. You know, it's like a, it's this huge distance. You know, so it gives you a sense of uh, the difficulties and the distances and the heat and the, you know, Jesus went into the desert. You think, well, that's nice. That's been nice. You know, well, it's hot as hell. <laughs> it's like 115 degrees, so you know my, my respect for the apostles also grew as well. So it, it really grounded the Gospels in a way that I couldn't have uh, understood or really appreciated, and it was very moving simply to be there and to say, he was here, he was here, he was here, he was here. No, I, I totally resonate with what you're saying. And I would just add, and I, I say this with a little bit of, what should I say, hesitation. But what Christians have done over the years in many of these places is build a church. And to me, that detracted from what Jim is describing. You know, to me, the most wonderful places in uh, the Holy Land, in the Sea of Galilee, and the temple in Jerusalem, the Western Wall, what's left standing of the temple that was there at the time of Jesus. Also, the uh, Garden of Gethsemane olive trees, which they say some of them are over 2,000 years old. And when I was there at one point, the guide said, these trees have seen the Lord. So there's things that connect with him. you know. But like when you go to uh, Nazareth and there's this huge shrine to Mary, or you go to Cana and they're selling bottles of wine in the sacristy of the church, really. And places like, but it, it wasn't, it was, there were no churches there in those days. You know? So in a sense, the, the value of the church, I understand it, is to claim this property for the Christians in a land that is both Muslim and Jewish at, in conflict. You know, so it has that kind of value. But it doesn't have, therefore, the, the same resonance of connecting up with the person of Jesus that you have in some of the more natural places in the temple. I was with a very funny Jesuit friend uh, on my trip, which I talk about in the book, and we were at the Basilica of the Annunciation, which is the, the big church in Nazareth, and there's the, the grotto where tradition has it that Mary was, you know, met by the angel. Or, and, uh, we, and so upstairs there's this huge modern 1960s concrete church. And uh, so we walked upstairs, and my friend George said, you know, isn't that nice? After Mary had her visit from the angel, she could go to mass upstairs. <laughs> I just want to 
mention what we're looking at here. This was shared by Father Martin. This is William Hart McNichols, yeah. uh, who was a uh, Catholic artist, and uh, this is an image he's put together of Jesus. So uh, that's what we're looking at here. Um, this question is for uh, for both of you, but maybe we could start with Professor Johnson. Maybe you can just speak about one of your favorite gospel stories and why it speaks to you. Okay. Um, I would pick, if I had to go right out of the gate here, I would pick John's Gospel, uh, chapter 20, the end of the Gospel, the scene where Mary Magdalene is weeping outside the tomb. And she has been there at the cross. She was there where he was buried, so she and other women knew where he was and came to finish anointing the body on Sunday morning, and the body is gone. And there's something so poignant when she says you know, to the gardener, have you taken him away? Let me have the body. We're so um, wanting to have the remains of our loved one. Um, but anyway, of course, the gardener turns out to be the risen Jesus. And he says to her, Mary. And it goes back to John's Gospel, where the good shepherd knows his sheep and calls them by name. And she recognizes him then, Rabboni, the teacher. And then, so there's this wonderful sense of healing and hope in the because it says she's outside the tomb weeping then what really gets good is he says to her go and tell my preface um, that i'm risen and so on it gives her the message gives her the apostolic commission to preach the resurrection and she is the first one in the gospel of john to have an appearance of the resurrection the risen lord experience and then commissioned by him to go and tell the others so in the Middle Ages, or even starting with Augustine, they called her the Apostle to the Apostles. And when I uh, teach this, I say, don't only think of her role, but think of it this way. The risen Christ could have picked anybody to appear to first. He could have picked anybody to commission to go announce his resurrection to the rest of the disciples, and he picked her. And what is the matter with the church today? <laughs> I might even take that one step further. I was on a retreat uh, up at Eastern Point Retreat House uh, in Gloucester, Mass, and it was on Jesus, and it was myself uh, and two women. And uh, the woman who was preaching on uh, this passage, which is also one of my favorites, uh, shared something, and the woman's name is Joanne Fantini. She's the director of Eastern Point Retreat. Uh, she said, which honestly blew my mind, and I'm used to with audiences, and you can see it kind of like the waves go out. She said, uh, so, so as Beth was saying, so the risen Lord appears to Mary Magdalene, she is sent to the apostles. She said, in the time between, the good news is preached to her and she sees the risen one. And she meets the apostles, say, an hour or two later. Mary Magdalene was the church. She was the church. Which I find, honestly, that just sort of changed me, just in terms of how I see her and see the church. So I just wanted to share that with you. I would pick um, I would pick the story of Lazarus for me, also from John's Gospel. Um, I I go back and forth on which is my favorite passage. It used to be the, the Annunciation. It used to be the Jairus Demoniac. Now it's Lazarus. I find that it's such a rich story in terms of not only Jesus' humanity and his divinity. You know, we know Jesus wept. Uh, and I read something recently that said that it was so beautiful. You know, why did Jesus weep? He couldn't help it. You know, he loved, we know he loved Mary and Martha very much. That's, that's uh, said in the Gospels. When uh, he's with his disciples, he, he receives word that Lazarus is sick. And what do they say? They don't say, your friend Lazarus. They don't say, Lazarus of Bethany. They don't say, Mary, Martha's brother. You know what they say? The Greek is so pretty. It's home phileis. He whom you love. Isn't that beautiful? He whom you love is ill. He waits, which is also mysterious, you know, I mean, why is he waiting? You know, what's going on? There's a sense of God's mystery and Jesus' is kind of agency, you know, God will go and God will go. But then the great thing is Mary and Martha, very strong women, you know, usually when you hear people preach it, it's, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. <laughs> but I often think of her saying, Lord, if you had been here, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I often say, imagine... If you had a friend who was sick and you had another friend who's a doctor, you say, come and see him. 
you know, because presumably Mary and Martha would have known about him raising people from the dead. So there's this, there's this great humanity, right, which I think is, is so beautiful. And then Jesus weeps at the tomb, and, but that's not the, the, the only part of the story, is his great divine power is shown. You know, Lazarus come forth, which I think is, I, I was in the tomb of Lazarus uh, last two years ago, and uh, all by myself. And, you know, imagining Jesus kind of, kind of saying that to all of us, come out of your tombs, you know. And then the other great part about Lazarus is at the end, everyone's probably so stupefied. I think in John's Gospel, he doesn't say, and they were all amazed, because he probably doesn't have to. Um, Jesus says this very simple thing, you know, untie him and let him go. And I imagine all the people kind of like, <laughs> Jesus is saying something very practical, untie the guy. You know? So that's, I think, currently my favorite story. Yeah. Back to Mary Magdalene for one moment. Uh, Easter Sunday, we say a special sequence prior to the proclamation of the gospel about the risen Christ. It's only that one day a year in, in the Catholic liturgy. And in the middle of the sequence, we say, tell us, Mary, what you saw. And she announces, I saw the empty tomb, I saw the linens folded, and then in her word, Christ indeed is risen, and so on. So we hear her telling us every Easter. It kind of flies by, but I think it's a very important moment to connect up with the gospel that's going to come. Well, I'm going to take a question here that I think builds on this conversation, which is, uh, oh, Jim, how, was, how were you influenced by feminist theology as you started uh, work on your book? Well, I would say that uh, feminist theology influenced me uh, first in theology school, uh, in graduate theology studies, and I was introduced to She Who Is, which I highly recommend by Elizabeth Johnson, CSJ. Uh, the book that really shocked me, um, which I read before She Who Is, was a book called In Memory of Her by Elizabeth Schussler Fiorenza. And honest, I, I was reading it again this afternoon just to refresh my memory. The book begins uh, with a, a sort of analysis of a little passage from the Gospel of Mark where Jesus is, Jesus is anointed by a woman, right? And Jesus says, wherever this story is told, you know, it will be told in memory of her, right? And Elizabeth Schuster Fiorenza says, and we don't even know her name. And she says, and yet we know the name of his betrayer. You know, and so, and she also traces later on how she's moved into, I think, Luke's gospel, a sinner. She's kind of conflated with a sinner. You know, I, 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 I can remember sitting at my desk and reading that and being shocked. And for me, feminist theology has helped me understand the gospel, not uh, clearly, you know, from, you know, looking at, uh, you know, how women, uh, women's contributions were kind of set aside and also sort of understand them as, True disciples, you know, particularly at the end. Not only that, not only the obvious things you would think that feminist theology would focus on, but it reminded me that the way we read the Gospels, you know, is conditioned by who we are, what we're, what we sort of bring to the table, uh, and so it, it just reminded me that there's always something new, and scholars can always teach us something new, right? So it's, it's not just the insights that it taught me about women in the Gospels; it's to kind of be critical, um, you know. It opened me up to all sorts of ways of understanding the Gospels that I think I've been closed down to. So uh, to take that a step further, one of the things I'm most interested in now, and by the way, in addition to Beth Johnson and Elizabeth Schuster Fiorentz, I would also count Sandra Schneider's is very helpful in my own sort of thinking about the Gospels, um, is Jesus's Jewishness. So Amy Jo Levine has written a great deal about Jesus's Jewishness. So things we kind of take for granted, I think, is what I learned not that from feminist theology. Like, don't take these things for granted. The kind of received wisdom is often incomplete. And so can you look at it from a woman's point of view? Can you look at it with an, uh, a sort of a specific attention to women's roles in the Gospels? And, and to take that further, can you look at it from a Jewish point of view? You know, can you look at it from a liberation theology point of view? So it kind of broke it all open for me. And that moment, really, when I read that about the woman who anointed Jesus, whose name we don't know, was really kind of mind-blowing. Because it said, the things that you think you know about the Gospels, you, you need to know a little bit more about them. So incredibly helpful for me. Do you have anything to say about feminist theology? <laughs> <laughs> I'll 
just add the important point about that woman in Mark 14. She anointed Jesus on his head. We have so many stories of women anointing Jesus' feet. And Elizabeth Joseph Fiorentz's interpretation, it's the beginning of the passion narrative in Mark. Jesus is in Jerusalem. He's two days short of the crucifixion. And he's at dinner. And she comes in and anoints him on his head with perfumed oil, very expensive, and so on. And gets criticized. And Jesus says, leave her alone. She has anointed my body for its burial. And whatever she has done shall be told in memory of her. So what Elizabeth says is that the anointing of someone on the head comes from the Jewish tradition of the anointing of the king by the prophet. And here is a disciple who understands what's happening and commissions him to his messianic destiny at a time when the other disciples, some male disciples, are still saying, you know, this will never happen to you. They will deny him. They will betray him. But here's a woman who understood. And he, Jesus appreciated it. He understood what she was doing and gave her that praise. Whatever, wherever the gospel is told in the world, what she has done shall be told in memory of her. And Elizabeth's point is, not only that we don't know her name, but it hasn't been told. And I think it's also interesting that these are still dangerous stories to tell. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've told that story in gatherings, and people are saying, well, what do you mean by that? <laughs> oh, you draw your own conclusions. <laughs> they're, they're still threatening. It's still dangerous. And saying these things about Mary Magdalene and the unnamed woman and Mary Bethany and Martha and female disciples, it's, it's dangerous. It's threatening to people, but it should be. You know, Jesus is shaking things up, but, uh, and I'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, let's talk about another area uh, of Jesus that makes people nervous, and that's the idea of Jesus' consciousness, which is something that I know, uh, Father Jim, you've talked about many times in terms of how. Um, uh, Professor Johnson works influenced you. So maybe you, you uh, Professor Johnson could speak a bit about that idea and you can respond. One of the things the historical critical method has given us is the realization that Jesus lived a full human life. So it's a retrieval of his humanity, not only bodily, not only historically, but also in terms of his own consciousness. Um, the question, did he know he was God, you know, upsets people sometimes. I said, you think he woke up saying the Nicene Creed? I said, I'm not in being with the Father, you know, no. First, he said the consubstantial, right? He, uh, this was a first century Jew who worshipped Yahweh according to the Jewish tradition. Right? And, it, and the thing is, how do we reconcile that? then with the doctrine that he is truly God and truly human and that he is the word of God made flesh in incarnation. And the way that has made more sense to me and now obviously for me to Jim comes from Karl Rahner, the German Jesuit theologian. And his understanding is to say, think of yourself. And isn't it true you are who you are, but you can't articulate that fully until you have some life experience, and even then, it's not complete. You, you, you could be on your deathbed and still know more about who you are. So what Ron says, we have an implicit knowledge of ourselves, a grasp of who we are, and an explicit knowledge, which we can put out there in terms of you know, height and weight and bi biography and things like that. And if we take that human consciousness of ourselves and apply it to Jesus, the same thing would be true. I mean, he is the incarnate word of God, so he has a grasp of that implicitly. And he explains the authority with which he taught about God, it explains his approach toward the poor, it explains uh, a lot about his own self-confidence. But he wasn't there uh, fully apprised of later church doctrine about him. So it's, it, did he know he was God? Rana ends this discussion by saying yes and no. <laughs> yes in the implicit way, no in the explicit way. And I love the way Raymond Brown, the Catholic biblical scholar, um, ended his discussion of this, a very long essay in which he analyzes every biblical text where Jesus admits ignorance. He doesn't know the day of the end of the world, and who touched me, and all these different things. You know. 
And he ends up quoting Cyril of Jerusalem, a second century theologian who says, and I know this by heart, and Cyril is now talking about Jesus. We admire his goodness in that for love of us, he did not shrink from assuming everything that applies to our humanity, including in which is ignorance. So Jesus then, you could say, led a regular human life. If, if you know ahead of time everything that's going to happen to you and it's all, all your lines are scripted, it's like you're an actor on a stage, but that's not a real human life. And, and so the genuine humanity is honored the deeper you can go into honoring his own consciousness as a human being. Very gifted human being, a charismatic one, a genius religiously, but still a very human being in that regard. Yeah, that's the approach that I found uh, most helpful, this idea of growing in your own identity. And, and as Beth was saying, and it fits with our own experience as human beings. Um, and I think it's also, I, I, I remind people sometimes, it will always remain a mystery, how this divine consciousness you know, interacts with the, if you want to use the word interacts with this human consciousness, right? Because there are times when he does seem to know more than, you know, she is not dead, she is only asleep, those kinds of things. So he, he predicts his, his crucifixion, those kinds of things. But I think my, my reading of it is also that um, through the Gospels, you can kind of see hints of that. So, for example, uh, you know, in the Gospel of Luke, we're told he progressed in wisdom. You know, why else would you progress in wisdom if you knew everything at the beginning of your life, right? Um, at the wedding feast at Cana, I like, he seems distinctly reluctant to perform that miracle. And in fact, Mary has to kind of invite him to do it. I like to think, I mean, remember, these are, these are real people. There's a great insight by uh, F.J. Sheed uh, that I quote in the book, uh, it's his book, To Know Christ Jesus. He said, um, why must we always think of them as so tight-lipped with one another? You know, would Mary have discussed the experiences that she had, you know, the Annunciation? She, would Mary have discussed with Jesus his, of course she would have. You know, they, Mary's like in the house and he's sawing and they never talk to each other. <laughs> so, so for me, there's a sense that Mary at the wedding feast of Cana, perhaps, I don't know, this is speculative, may have understood his mission better than he did at that time, you know, was inviting him into that. So he kind of grows in that. And, and, you know, and he does grow on that, you know, when the leper says, if you choose, will you make me clean? I do choose. There's this, there is this great confidence. And yet we don't know, you know, when did his, when did he finally understand that vocation? I will quote, my favorite quote on this is Elizabeth Johnson. Perhaps even, perhaps it took even uh, the resurrection, perhaps it was up until the resurrection, when, quote, his ultimate identity burst upon him in all clarity, end quote. Johnson. So that's a beautiful thing too, that he goes, you know, I don't know this for sure, that he goes to his death not fully certain, you know, which makes to me his sacrifice all the more beautiful, you know. I believe Jesus was fully obedient to the Father, which he was, 100% fully obedient to the Father. He knew that something beautiful was going to come out of his obedience. He knew that something beautiful and new would come out of his turning himself over to the Father. I don't know and I don't think that he knew what that was going to be. So I think that's kind of a beautiful image for me of, of growing in his vocation. Just to build on that, if Jesus was dying on the cross but knew he was going to rise again in three days, how agonizing could that have been? <laughs> again, we rob him of the, of the suffering uh, by attributing later understanding back, we retroject it. And that isn't, isn't the case. The thing there on the cross, Mark and Matthew both have him quoting Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And if you go through that psalm to the very end, it ends on a ringing note of hope that God will vindicate the just person and be there and bring new life. So we don't know in the, in the Gospels that he even got to the end, but he cried out in his abandonment. But he was in that Jewish pattern that God is with the, the person in their suffering and will bring life in the end. So in that sense, on the cross, he could still have hope. But to have the the actual detail that we then have once it happened in history. That, that again, is part of the ignorance, I think, in, in darkness. We don't know the future. You know? And, and he was in that same, uh, in joining us in our weakness that way. Uh, perhaps you both could speak, but I'll start with Father Martin. How your study into the life of Jesus helped you better understand your own 
a charism of your own religious order, first the Jesuits and then uh, Professor Johnson? Uh, I have been um, studying and thinking about and praying with Jesus uh, since I entered the Jesuits in 1988. Um, I really didn't think about him very much beforehand, other than this, you know, he's the son of God, he's all that. Um, and the more I study uh, Jesus, Jesus Christ, and, and it is, it was a, such a joyful thing to be able to spend time with the Gospels and to spend time with like the Sacropagina um, uh, Bible commentaries and learn and read the Greek again. It was just, it was just so joyful. The more I learn about him as a human being, uh, the more I learn about what his life was like, the more I love him, basically, and the closer I feel to him, and the closer I feel to him in prayer. Um, but by the same token, um, I'm connecting right now with the Christ of the faith. I mean, I was just on retreat, uh, by the way, because you need a nice place to go on retreat, Linwood Spiritual Center up in Rhinebeck. Uh, I was connecting with Jesus, the Christ of the faith, the risen one, you know, who, who encounters us through the Spirit. So I would say, uh, it's not simply my studies, uh, but it's also you know my prayer and, and my faith. Uh, so the more I become a Jesuit and the more I uh, grow in my vocation, the more I love Jesus. And the more I love Jesus, I think the hopefully the better a Jesuit I'm becoming. Uh, my my ministry and my life makes no sense without Jesus, and I think that's the way it should be. One time, um, Pedro Rupe, the former Superior General of the Society of Jesus from uh, '63 to '81, was asked, which I, I just love this. Uh, who is Jesus for you? And you know, someone might ask you that. We were asked that on retreat. Um, you know, who do you say that I am? That was one of the, the passages that we were. By the way, great, here's a little like, free spiritual advice. Um, so one of the um, retreat directors was preaching one day, and that was the passage uh, in the gospel, who do you say that I am? And she said, uh, as a suggestion for prayer, she said, uh, listen to Jesus ask that question of you. Who do you say that I am? Right? And you know, and so I thought that's nice, you know. And then she said, and ask that question of Jesus. Who do you say that I am? It's beautiful. Say to the Lord, who am I for you? Which is really pretty. Um, but anyway, they asked Pedro Arupe that, Arupe that question. And you know, you expect that he would say, Jesus is my Savior, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is risen one. You know what he said? Who is Jesus for me? For me, Jesus is everything. So that's how I like to think about it. So are you asking me the nation question? <laughs> the, the, well, I just feel, uh, today, let me say, today in class, I teach a course right now at Fordham called Christ in World Cultures. And it's undergraduate, and we begin with Jesus in his own culture. So we're actually very much doing this kind of thing in class. And then we go to Latin America, Asia, Africa, Europe and North America, and look at how Christ in our own day is being understood. Um, and one student today, catching on to this historical Jesus, the Jesus of the Gospels, the really human Jesus, raised his hand in class, he said, if he's that human, then we can be like him, right? It was a revelation in that class, in that moment for him. And I said, exactly, you know, never exactly like him, on our own way. But anyone who is a disciple, by definition, puts their feet in the footsteps of Jesus and follows after him, follows his way, and becomes Christ in the world today through the power of his spirit. And to me, that is the power of this kind of study and this kind of conversation. And that's, again, why the historical and the Christ of faith don't conflict. You know, because it becomes transformative of the person today who takes this approach to Jesus in the way they themselves are toward others. Um, if I may say, I think the whole movement in the church today toward social justice, toward option for the poor, toward working with those who have not, I mean, you could point to Matthew chapter 25, you know, the sheep and the goats, and as long as you did it to one of these, you did it to me, or didn't do it, you didn't do it to me. But that's always been true. The church has had tremendous history of charity toward the sick, and the poor and those in difficulty. But today we take it to another level with justice saying we need to change the structures that are creating all this misery. And I find again with the students that I teach, those who are most active that way have the most 
human historical grasp of who Jesus is, motivating their own spirituality. So it very much flows into the life of faith and discipleship today, I think, in our culture to take this kind of approach. Well, I want to remind everybody that if you have questions, please do write them down. And we have people in the back who can collect them, because probably in about 10 minutes, we'll start taking some questions from the audience. But I want to spend that time talking about uh, Professor Johnson's book, which is Ask the Beast, Darwin, and the God of Love. Uh, what did you discover, and I know this is a part of your book, about Jesus' relationship with the natural world? Thank you, Tim, for that wonderful question. <laughs> I was uh, writing this book on creation, and knowing the natural world is in trouble today, what, what does religion, what does theology bring to the table? And we have this wonderful doctrine of creation, which we you know, go to right away. God created the world and loves it, and therefore we should also love it and care for it. But I thought, is there anything more? Because at the center of Christian faith is the person of Jesus Christ. And so is it just peripheral? You know, you think about creation in the beginning or whatever. Or can Christ connect up with it? And I found two or well, three areas very rich. The first is the incarnation. When John's Gospel said, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Flesh in Greek is sarx. The Gospel does not say the Word became human. It became flesh. And when you read the Gospel, flesh is something humans have in common with the animals. It's what is material, what is vulnerable and fragile and can die. Um, it is what suffers and so on. And so there's a, a tradition in Christian theology, which I went back and, you know, tried to surface, that the incarnation has the eternal God coming into creation, not just as a human being, as a human being, but through being human, in solidarity with all other creatures, with everything that's material. And there are really fine quotes from many uh, mystics, many saints, and as recently as uh, Pope John Paul II said, the Incarnation is a cosmic event. So you have the God who created the world, then in the Word of God, becoming united with the flesh of the world, which puts Christ right at the center of the earth, which sounds very much like Teilhard, but it's Teilhard de Chardin, it does. But it, there's a very strong biblical foundation for that view. And the second area was the cross, if you continue on with that then, the death of Christ on the cross in solidarity with all of us who die, which includes the animals, um, is putting God in the midst of the pain, not only of humans, but of others in the earth. And then finally, the great resurrection, when Christ bodily is risen from the dead, the sarks again, which is good news for the future, not only of human beings, but of all creation and all creatures. If you think of the Easter Vigil, um, the wonderful hymn that is sung once a year on that feast day, the Exultet, begins, Rejoice, O earth in shining splendor, Christ is risen. It's, it's an announcement that the church is singing to the whole earth at the Easter Vigil, not just to humans. So in working with that Christological mystery of the, you know, you might say Christmas, Good Friday, Easter, uh, there's a way of reading the New Testament texts that include other creatures in the good news, not just humans. Now, other creatures do not sin, and I will focus on the fact that this takes sin away from us uh, and forgives us our sins and so on, wouldn't apply. But the main thing we announce at Easter is the overcoming of death. Think of all the Easter texts. Christ is risen, alleluia. Life has a new future. And so in the letter to the Colossians, for example, that early Christian hymn in chapter 1, where they talk about Christ as the firstborn of all creation. And there are many other texts like that through the New Testament. Again, once you open your eyes to that aspect, it begins to come up everywhere. So there is one uh, group that has put out what they call the Green Bible. 
and they print in green ink all the all the texts that have to do with ecology um, in both the, the Hebrew scriptures and the Christian scriptures. And it's astonishing how much of it's there. In other words, we have been very focused on ourselves in the way we told the story of Jesus. And I think the crisis we're in ecologically could awaken us that it's much, much richer than just ourselves. There's also a sense that um, Jesus uses creation. Jesus is not afraid to use creation. I mean, obviously, in the parables, he's using all sorts of images from the natural world. I mean, he knows, you know, this is someone who grew up in, a, in an agrarian town, right? He, he's speaking to people who know the natural world, who are embedded in the natural world. But also on the more, and you know, he uses water, things like that. But also, one of the passages that I like, just a, a, a small uh, a gloss on what Beth was saying, uh, he made a paste with saliva and dirt. And my, I mean that, you know, and there's another part that says, um, and, you know, he made, he used saliva on the man's eyes. Well, in the Greek, it's actually spitting in the man's eyes. You know, there's this, and when I read that, I thought, uh, I think Gerhard Loving points this out in his book, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus is not afraid of bodily things, right? He uses his saliva. I mean, how much more bodily and earthy uh, and, and embedded in nature and creation can you get, you know? So I think we, we, you know, as Beth was saying, we have to kind of recover that sense of, of not only Jesus in creation, but Jesus also using creation and being comfortable with it as well. Thank you. Um, I uh, will invite questions now. Um, if there's folks want to put them down the aisle, we're going to take them in index card form. We got one here. I've also got more questions that I can ask if uh, other folks. All right, thank you. All right, thank you all. All right, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, I'm going to start with this one. You just keep putting there. Why do you think that the living word, Jesus, is increasingly not appealing to a secular American society? I'm going to start with Rodney. It's like a book topic. Can you say that again? Why do I think that the living word, Jesus, why is Jesus not appealing to a secular American society? Well, uh, I would say that he is appealing to some in a secular American society, but I think um, Jesus is uncomfortable. Jesus makes people uncomfortable. Uh, you know, we want to try to tame Jesus. I often use the example of Thomas Jefferson actually going to a gospel, the Gospels of the New Testament with scissors and cutting out all the parts of the story that he didn't like, i.e. the miracles and, uh, you know, the resurrection. Made him uncomfortable. A lot of things that Jesus says makes us uncomfortable. And I think in all, and I would say also the theological and political strikes, you know, we are made uncomfortable by Jesus. The problem is, um, you know, there's this great uh, book, uh, E.P. Sanders wrote a book on the historical Jesus, and E.P. Sanders read Thomas Jefferson's Bible, uh, and he wanted to get a sense of who Thomas Jefferson's Jesus was. And so at the end of his research, he realized that Jesus was this kind of wise sage, and he realized that Jesus was very much like Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> so we all tend to want a Jesus who kind of, uh, you know, affirms what we believe, and the stuff that we don't like, we say, oh, that's not as important, right? You know, so you go to a lot in terms of the poor. Well, we don't really have to listen to that part, right? Or, you know, frequently among uh, people who are, uh, you know, still finding their way to Jesus, I'm uncomfortable with the miracles. I mean, he's a wise teacher and everything, but you know, when a lot of the stuff that John Meyer makes the point that a lot of the stuff we take for granted, sayings that we take for granted, happen within the context of the miracle stories. Something like one third of Mark is miracles. So we we find him sometimes not appealing, not only because he's not presented well to us. You know, we're not invited to have an encounter with him. You know, not only the Jesus of history, but the Christ of faith. You know, a real encounter with him. Uh, but because also he makes us uncomfortable, and sometimes we prefer to sort of shy away from him, as he did in you know first century Judea and Galilee. And I would just add, I think the cross is off-putting to a lot of people. Um, the the agony of the cross and the idea, take up your cross and follow me. It's it doesn't fit with the uh, the American dream. <laughs> Um, it's very realistic in terms of the, the suffering that is in the world, 
but um, it's it's not uh, fit our culture when you take it from that angle. Thank you. These are great questions. I'm going to try to get to as many of them as possible. Uh, this is related. Oh, why is there so much contention, contentious argument about Jesus' death on the cross as atonement? <laughs> has at least 15 ways of understanding the cross, different metaphors. Sacrifice and atonement being one, taken from the Jerusalem temple. But they use legal metaphors, justification, very strong in the Lutheran tradition. They use medical uh, metaphors, he heals us, or saves us, solace is health in Latin. Um, he used, they, we used, um, the New Testament used redemptive metaphors, which are basically a business metaphor. You redeem your slave if you get money and buy the freedom for this slave and so on. Uh, you, you know, the study of what the cross was interpreted as in the New Testament is very rich. And it went on that way for a number of centuries. But in the 10th century, so roughly half of, you know, half of the Christian's existence, um, Ansel of Canterbury wrote this extremely intelligent book why did God become human and die to save us? Because he could have just wept one tear and it would have saved us. You know? What's it with the death? And he was living in feudal Europe and he took feudalism as the model for the universe and he thought of God as Lord of the manor and according to feudal law, remember this is before police and armies and states, right? The word of the Lord of the matter is the foundation of order in society. And if you disobey, you have to pay back, commensurate with your offense in order to maintain civil order. So he then says, every time we sin, we offend the Lord of the universe and we have to pay back. Now, none of us can pay back what we owe because the person we have offended is infinite. And so God sent his son, who is the son of God, who took on our offenses and died and paid back the debt that we owed. And since Jesus himself was sinless and didn't need any satisfaction, he's generous enough to spread it around and give it all to us. And so why did he become um, human and die to save us in order to pay back what we owe because of our sin. Now Anselm ends that treatise by saying, quote, and so you see God's mercy is greater than we could have imagined. You know, it's a beautiful treatise when you read it in its own context. But what happened was it passed on into other contexts and it began to get preached as if God were angry and needed a bloody death in order to take away the anger and forgive us. And so, and the atonement theory came down to us in that way. In other words, it lost its own context. It's not what the Bible means, it's not what Anselm meant, but it, be, it became popular theology, put it that way. And that is why it is today under criticism is God angry with us when we sin? Did God need Jesus to die on the cross in order to forgive us? What kind of God is this? Is this the God that Jesus preached? And I will end with this. People who are working on this say, look at Jesus' own teaching about God when we sin. And the key parable there is the parable of the prodigal son. And you know how the father greets the returning son. But if you put the atonement theory into there, Jesus would have said, the younger son comes back and the father says, no, you can't come in until you pay back the debt. And so the older brother says, I'll help you, and goes out and works in the fields until he drops down dead from exhaustion. And then the father looks at the youngest son and said, okay, you can come in. <laughs> That's the parable of the prodigal son according to the atonement theory. Sorry. <laughs> So, so there's a tremendous effort to get back to the New Testament, get back to the Bible and the, God, and the teachings of Paul and the later writings. How did the early Christians interpret the cross, which, remember, was execution by the state? 
capital punishment. And not at all anything glorious or salvific, you know, in its own reality. And how did they interpret that this was a salvific act for us? And put that in touch with what we then began to think and revise our own thoughts on that. And I would just say that um, it's 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 still being preached. I mean, you still hear these things. And you know, the the closing prayer for Mass the other day was something like, "Let us fill up what is lacking in Christ's sufferings." So, boy, you know, I mean, that's that's yeah, that's that's from Paul. And and was something lacking in Christ's suffering? So this is there is this idea of kind of still having to pay God back, you know, for what we have done. And I really, I mean, in I do a lot of spiritual direction. I think in the spiritual life, there's no uh, more uh, serious barrier to people's connection with God than this idea of God as the unforgiving judge. You know, God as the person who is going to punish them, you know, and demands retribution, essentially. And a lot of that comes from people's own experiences with, say, their parents or teachers or other authority figures, but it really gets in the way. Um, and so you can see how this, this particular strain, because as, as Beth was saying, there are other ways of understanding the crucifixion, you know, and, 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 and Jesus' sacrifice. Uh, but this, I think, really gets in the way of people's connection with God. You know, so I think it really uh, unwittingly has done a lot of damage, even though Anselm's a saint. Um, I say I would say the prodigal son. I, when I was thinking of that parable, I think if the prodigal son came back. Oh, by the way, you know, notice that the the father forgives the prodigal son even before he has asked for forgiveness, which I think is so beautiful. I mean, and and the the Greek is so great. It says the father uh, fell on his neck, constantly kissing him. So tender, you know. But I would say that the older brother would probably hear that the father said, "You have to pay me back." The older brother would say, "Good." That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, this is for uh, Father Martin. Does Jesus have to be divine? <laughs> well, he is. So, so I'm saying, yeah, that's a, okay. Does Jesus have to be divine? Um, I'm not sure how to take that question. Maybe does Jesus have to be divine for me to believe in him? Uh, let me just say this. Uh, I believe that Jesus is fully human and fully divine. Now, the problem is how to kind of bring those two things together. It's a mystery. It's the most beautiful mystery I know. Uh, it's a mystery that I don't think is going to be answered, you know, here, uh, you know, tonight. It's a mystery that I think we'll understand fully. You know, as St. Paul says, we, we will see fully. You know, we will understand fully. Uh, but I really... Um, I think that actually it's harder for people to believe in his divinity today than his humanity. You know, for all the good emphasis on the historical Jesus, it is very hard for people to believe in Jesus' divinity, which, and I would, I would connect to that, the stories of the miracles, the resurrection, that he's truly risen, that it's not just kind of a, a metaphor, it's not just kind of shared memory. It's very hard for people to understand that, and I think that it is, it is hard to kind of grasp that, but it, it does stand in, in people's way. And does Jesus have to be divine? No, but he is, and I'm happy he is. No. <laughs> I, would, I don't know who wrote this question, but I always want to get to the bottom of it and say, what do you mean by divine? And what is the image of God behind this question starting out? You know? So if, if you have the understanding of God as the infinite mystery of love, you know, the summary of God at the end of the New Testament, one of the last letters of John, is God is love. And that's as a result of the experience with Jesus. If you think that love is at the heart of the universe, infinitely more than we can imagine. And this love took shape in Jesus and acted this way toward people who were in difficulty and with his friends and so forth and so on. Um, I don't see any problem with saying he is divine. And that's it. In other words, if you think of divine nature as a substance and human nature as another substance and you try to bring them together like a sandwich or something, it's never going to work. You, know, you have to revise what you mean when you say God to really get to the heart of the infiniteness of who God is. And that Jesus becomes the revelation of God in the flesh. Okay, I'm going to ask these two questions together because I think they are related. The first is uh, pretty direct. Please explain to me why women are not called to be priests. And the second has to do, uh, why do you think, what do you think Jesus would teach about Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians that women should not preach? It seems so inconsistent with the rest of his writing, uh, of this writing, and does not flow with the rest of Paul's writings. You can 
all prophecy, etc. Can you read that second question again? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. What do you think Jesus would teach about Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians that women should not preach? Okay, I got that. Um, <laughs> well, nothing against Paul, but you know, as Beth was pointing out to us, his first thing, his first commission after the resurrection was to go tell Mary Magdalene to preach, basically. And that's what she's doing. She's proclaiming the good news. So I would say that Jesus on this point would disagree with Paul. Uh, sorry, St. Paul. Uh, why aren't women called to be priests? Is that the, that's the question? Please explain. Please explain. Well, actually, women are called to be priests. I know many women who feel called to the priesthood. So I think, I mean, that's pretty clear to me. Women, I know, Catholic women feel called to the priesthood. So that's my answer to that question. The Vatican Statement on this question came out in 1976, and it gives three reasons. One, Jesus only called 12, only ordained 12 apostles, so the example of Jesus the church has to follow. Two, there is an unbroken tradition that only men were ordained to the priesthood, and the church cannot depart from that tradition. And three, only men can represent Christ at the Eucharist when they say, this is my body, this is my blood. That's the iconic argument. There must be a natural resemblance. All right, we have a few more here. Um, why did Jesus not want Mary to touch him when they first met after the resurrection? Yeah. The answer to that question is, I don't know. That's a wonderful... I find that so interesting. Um, you know, there are ways of looking at what's called the glorified body, which is Jesus' self, Jesus' appearance after the resurrection. And what I find interesting about thinking about that is how difficult it was for the gospel writers and, and I would assume for the, uh, the disciples to explain what they had seen. Now, this is, this is something that no one has seen before or since. And so in some passages, Jesus is definitely physical. Touch me, he says. Look at me. And it says to Thomas, put your finger in my wounds and your hand in my side. He says, do you have any fish to eat? Right? I mean, touch me. See that it's me. Right? In others, he seems distinctly, um, almost ghostly. He, he sort of appears and kind of seems, seemingly walks through walls. He appears in a, in a, in a, in a, a room that, with the door closed. In others... You know, Mary, how can Mary mistake him for the gardener? She's been following him. You know, the, some people have said, well, she's been crying and her eyes are red or something like that. But, you know, this is someone she's been following presumably for one to three years, right? They don't, they don't know who he is when he's, you know, fishing, uh, when, when he's preparing the, the breakfast of fish. So my understanding of that body is that it was just difficult for people to explain. And I think one of the, actually the most sort of, for me, moving so-called proofs of the resurrection is if the gospel writers want to kind of normalize everything and kind of prove these things, they would make Jesus the same in every resurrection appearance. But what you can see is the difficulty of trying to explain what he was like, what they experienced, what they saw. And so all these questions about the glorified body, I think, are really up in the air for me. I, I think from a spiritual point of view, uh, from a theological point of view, there's a sense that he says, I, I need to ascend to my father. Okay. From a spiritual point of view, I think that the message might be Mary Magdalene is so overcome by seeing her Lord and her friend, let's say that too, I mean it's not just her Lord and her teacher, but her friend, you know, the person she loves so much, that she did what any of us would do, you know, which was one that I, I imagine him saying, because he says, do not cling to me, which to me, when you read between the lines, I mean, she's starting to cling to him. She's starting to kind of reach out and hug him, you know, and also I just want to say, I love this story, I also want to say, you know, Mary Magdalene is clearly a, a treasured member of the early church, and so these stories, you know, you know, we can assume are coming from her, right? And she would have remembered these things. So she remembers, you know, uh, Mary and Rabuni, right? Which are in Aramaic in the in the Greek. The, the Greek kind of takes a step back and uses the Aramaic, Maria, right? It's Maria as it's described. Maria does this. Maria does this. But when he says her name, it's Maria in Aramaic, which is so beautiful. And it's the sense of Mary Magdalene kind of telling us this story. But she does what's natural, which is she wants to hold on to him. And my sense is, at least as I read it from a spiritual point of view, is that he's saying, no, no, you have something more important to do right now. 
You know, do not cling to me. It's like when we have these great spiritual experiences, it's like the transfiguration. Go, go out. You know, this is what I commission you to do, which is very beautiful. I mean, in the first moments of his risen life, you know, he is commissioning people to preach the good news. So that's my thought about it. I, I, I'm curious to know what Beth would think, but that's how I kind of see these things. We don't know about the glorified body. We don't know the sense of the state of it. Uh, but we also, that's from a kind of theological point of view, but from a spiritual point of view, he is telling her what he wants her to do. You know, he is giving her uh, her mission, uh, which I think is very beautiful. Well, those are very fine answers, and I would only add to that. I think it's an announcement that the days of his earthly life are over. You don't have me anymore the way you did. I died. He truly died. And that changes everything when you lose somebody that you love. You don't have them again the way you had them before. And he is, he is ascending to his face, into the glorified Christ of faith. So there's a change in the relationship. I think that's what that signals. Well, I want to thank everybody for the questions. And of course, I want to thank uh, our two panelists for this discussion. So please, round of applause for them. Upstairs, so we invite you to continue the conversation there. Thank you all.